Something else to consider now that Texas has been annexed to the United States is what becomes of the Comanche Empire. You know, the Comanche Empire has had a huge influence over the history of this state up to this point. Well, let's roll the, the timeline back a little bit and go into the early 1840s. In the early 1840s, the Comanches are stepping up the raids into Mexico. They are causing all sorts of havoc for that nation. Uh, and in, 18, in the early 1840s, the Bent brothers up on, at Bent's Fort on the Arkansas River managed to negotiate a peace between the Comanches and their nearby rivals, the Arapahoes and the Cheyennes. Well, now that you have this prairie peace, the Comanches are able to put more of their energy towards raiding into Mexico. So what in, emerges from this is a, a greater, more potent Comanche empire that now has brought into its commercial sphere all the trade networks of the Arapahoes and the Cheyennes. So now all of a sudden, you have Comanche trade goods going all the way into the middle part of the continent, all the way into the present-day American Midwest. Uh, Mexico suffers, and the Comanches start to really prosper. Well, what's this Comanche power look like? Uh, it's unprecedented. Not only do you have Comanches uh, as their own sort of entity, the Comanche uh, Empire, but now you have vassal states like the Wichita's, and now you have allies like the Kiowas and the Kiowa Apaches that are throwing in as well. So you have almost reinforcements and coalitions of Indians uh, that are now heading down into Mexico to raid and plunder. In fact, the Comanches were so good at what they were doing, some of the impoverished New Mexicans <laughs> actually go out and join the Comanches. Essentially say, I'd rather be an Indian and live like you guys than to remain a New Mexican and be poor all the time. It's estimated that in the late 1840s, the Comanches and their allies could put about 2,500 warriors in the field. Well, what are these guys doing besides raiding down into Mexico? They're also trading. The Comanches expand their trade network, especially in buffalo hides. Uh, buffalo killing starts to spike. Uh, in fact, part of what they offer to the Cheyennes and the Arapahoes was for them to have access to their hunting grounds. Well, there is so much demand for Comanche buffalo products that the Comanches actually have to go out and capture more people to keep the workflow up. They enslave people. And these slaves, mostly women and also young boys, uh, essentially are put to two tasks. The women are put to dressing the hides, Oftentimes, they become second wives or concubines of some of the more successful Comanches. And the young boys are essentially broken down and then rebuilt as Comanche boys. Um, in essence, the Comanche Empire is becoming extraordinarily multicultural. Uh, it's estimated by 1870 that some 45% of all living Comanches probably started out as Mexicans or Hispanic. So, the Comanche Empire is undergoing this interesting transformation, all in an effort to feed an insatiable market for buffalo hides. Well, what's good for business? Peace is good for business. So the Numina, the Comanches, reaffirm their friendship with the Americans when the Americans move into Texas with the Treaty of Council Springs in 1846. Uh, one of the signatories of this treaty, Buffalo Hump, understood all of a sudden that, you know, Comanche Empire was now in league with an American empire. And um, probably the best way to play this is to get along with the Americans where you can and to continue to harvest whatever trade goods you could, not only from Mexico, but also from the Great Plains with your buffalo hunts. And in fact, the Comanches, in order to get along with the Americans, send people all the way to the White House to meet with the president, James K. Polk, in order to make sure that all these relations are smooth and equitable for both sides. <laughs>